We just listened to the first two episodes of a new podcast, and we want to tell you all about it. The show is called Nobody Should Believe Me, and it's a groundbreaking investigation into Munchausen by proxy. Anyone who listens to Murder Sheet knows we really appreciate a deep dive into a subject. Well, no one has ever done anything of this depth and breadth on the topic before. You will be enthralled by the stories it tells, but even more importantly, you will learn a great deal about how to keep kids in your community safe from harm. But what makes this show different is that the host of the podcast, novelist Andrea Dunlop, has a uniquely personal connection to this subject. Someone close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy a while ago. So to her, this is not just something that happens to other people. Her personal story really gives this show an emotional punch. It also means she really makes an effort to get at the humanity of all of the people involved, all the victims and survivors. This isn't a podcast that focuses on the gruesome details. It has heart. Andrea really uses her storytelling skills to help us get to know the wide variety of people whose lives have been affected by Munchausen by proxy. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder, rape, and domestic violence. If you or someone you know is experiencing domestic abuse, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. As usual, we'll break down our sources at the end of the episode. Last year, when Ani and I lived in Brooklyn, we like to spend many of our evenings walking around Fort Greene Park, soaking up all of the sights and sounds. Even in the middle of a pandemic, there always seemed to be a great deal going on. Farmers markets, kids playing basketball, political candidates speaking at small rallies, and even birthday parties. One of our favorite spots was a towering 149-foot granite column that overshadowed everything else in the park. It may even have been the first place we ever visited there. It was the Prison Ship Martyrs Monument, built to honor the Americans who died in British prison ships during the Revolutionary War. But it is more than just a memorial. It is also a gravestone. The bones of many of the dead prisoners lie in a crypt just beneath the base of the tower. And that is not the only macabre detail about this monument. It was designed by Stanford White. Students of architecture remember him as the man who developed beautiful buildings and structures all over New York City. Many of these structures, like the Triumphal Arch in Washington Square Park, still stand today, as lovely as when they were first constructed. Anya and I, though, are what you'd call morbid, and so we remember Stanford White for something else entirely. He was the victim in a particularly notorious murder. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. Anya and I connected over the Burger Chef murders a 1978 unsolved case involving the killings of four young restaurant employees. Now we're looking to track restaurant homicides. To help us understand the patterns of these crimes, we created a spreadsheet of nearly a thousand eatery-related killings, the murder sheet. We'll be drawing on that data throughout season one to give you a deep dive into undercovered crimes. We don't just rely on skimming the headlines. We dive into these cases to bring you in-depth coverage. We're the Murder Sheet, and this is The Crime of the Century.
one of the unusual things about the murder of Stanford White is that there was never any mystery about the killing itself. Everyone knew exactly what happened. They just couldn't agree on whether or not anyone should be punished for it. It was June 25, 1906. The 52-year-old White arrived alone at Mademoiselle Champagne, a musical review that was playing on the roof of Madison Square Garden, the second of four places in New York to bear that name. He was interested in more than just the show. He planned to meet one of the chorus girls after the show. Perhaps he intended to take her to the studio he kept in the venue. White was late. The show already had started. When he got there, the performers were in the middle of a song called I Could Love a Thousand Girls. He was led to one of the tables in the empty area nearest the stage. These were the spots reserved for the best customers, and White was one of the very best indeed. Not only had he designed this particular iteration of Madison Square Garden, but everyone knew him as a generous spender in the theatrical scene. If he got friendly with a showgirl, she could expect that she and her friends would be showered with gifts. Among the other people in the crowd that night were Harry Thaw and his wife, the former Evelyn Nesbitt. This was not the first time that night they had been in the same place as White. Earlier that evening, they had been enjoying dinner at Martin's restaurant when White came in. Evelyn spotted him first, and something in her manner made Thaw realize something had upset her. He asked her what was wrong. She did not want to alarm the people near them, so she said nothing was bothering her. But a moment later, she slipped him a note. That B is here, she wrote. To the couple, B meant either blackguard or beast. Thaw knew at once that she was talking about Stanford White. And now, the three of them were all here for the show. The dancing girls on stage went into a song and dance routine about fencing. Perhaps that gave the 34-year-old Thaw an idea. Wearing an overcoat and a straw hat, he approached White's table. Up on the stage, the dancers had their prop weapons out. I challenge you, they sang, to a duel, a duel. Thaw pulled out a gun and shot White in the face. He fired three times. Bang, bang, bang. Thaw emptied the unfired bullets from his gun and held the weapon over his head, presumably so that people would know the shooting was over. At first, the people in the audience seemed to think it was all part of the show, but gradually the truth of what happened began to dawn upon them. A woman screamed. A doctor rushed through the crowd and found White lying on the floor in a pool of blood, his face black with burns from gunpowder. He was, quite obviously, dead. The stage manager jumped on top of a table and started yelling to the shell-shocked chorus, Go on playing! Bring on the chorus! The orchestra gave it a try and made an effort to keep playing, but the dancing girls who had just witnessed a man get killed in front of them were too stunned to dance. Bowing to the obvious, the manager decided to clear the audience. Thaw, meanwhile, made his way to the side of his wife, Evelyn. Oh, oh, she said. Why did you do it? It's all right, dear, he said. I have probably saved your life. Soon afterwards, Thaw handed his gun over to a man in uniform. He deserved it, said the killer. He ruined my wife. And then, after having committed murder in front of an audience, he was taken to the police station to face justice. When someone is accused of committing a crime, there are a few categories of defenses they can make. The most obvious defense, of course, is that the police have it wrong and that the accused man simply did not commit the offense. That defense was not available to Thaw. Too many people witnessed him shoot White, and he had freely confessed the act over and over again. Another defense is that the accused man did it, but he can't be held responsible for it because he was mentally ill. This defense was open to Thaw, but he and his family weren't enthusiastic about it. The Thaws were a prominent family that had made a fortune in railroads and banking. 
His sister had married a man with a title and was now a countess. And so they did not like the idea of publicly proclaiming that one of their own was criminally insane. The remaining defense is that the accused man did indeed commit the crime, but he had a really, really good reason. In most instances, this means self-defense. The accused had to kill in order to save his own life. That would not work in this case, but there were other variations that might. And so Thaw and his attorneys decided to go this route. To suggest that Thaw had a right to kill White because of the so-called unwritten law, which gives a husband the right to kill men who have wronged their wives. This could even be linked back to the insanity defense. They could claim that Thaw was perfectly sane before and after the murder, but when he saw White, Thaw was so enraged by the memory of what White had done that he became temporarily insane, just for the moment or two it took to kill. To consider whether that defense could work, of course, it becomes necessary to take a close look at Evelyn Nesbitt and her relationship with Stanford White. In the mid-1890s, when Evelyn was around 10 years old, her father died, leaving her mother alone to care for Evelyn and her younger brother. 19th century America offered few economic opportunities or options for women. Evelyn's mother tried to make a living making dresses or working in department stores, but soon had to rely on charity. Not having enough money changes a person. When you do not know if you will have enough money to pay your rent or put food on the table, that soon becomes all you think about. Even if you later become financially comfortable, you may remain haunted by the fear that it could all be taken away once more and you could be thrust again into a place where you had to worry about being able to afford even the barest necessities of life. Some commentators criticize Mrs. Nesbitt for being so concerned about cash, but can you really blame her? And we can only speculate about what growing up in this sort of environment did to Evelyn and how it made her think about money. The family moved about, and when Evelyn was 15 or 16, eventually ended up in New York City. Even at that young age, Evelyn was considered a great beauty. And in 1901, just as today, beauty is a commodity that can be sold. Evelyn started working as a model, striking sometimes suggestive poses for a variety of artists. She even appeared in advertisements for companies like Coca-Cola. She was said by some to be the most beautiful model in all America. And then she moved on getting work as a chorus girl or actress in a variety of Broadway shows. This is when she started to get into relationships with men. An early favorite was the famous actor John Barrymore. The two spent quite a bit of time together, and he's even said to have proposed to her. But Evelyn's mother opposed the marriage. She didn't think the actor had enough money. The ones with the real money were the producers. She began seeing the producer George Letterer. The couple became close enough that Letterer's wife named Evelyn in her divorce suit. But then she met Stanford White. The famous architect had a reputation that had nothing to do with the buildings he designed. Author Frederick Collins quoted a chorus girl who explained it all. Most chorus girls considered it a great feather in their cap to be seen with Stanford White. He was generous to an extreme. If he had a pet in a show, she could entertain the entire company at his expense. He paid doctor's bills for chorus girls he never saw. He paid hundreds of dollars for cabs for girls and their friends. Every girl knew what his attentions meant, and most of us would give a year's salary to get those attentions. On one occasion, he gave a little dinner to a lot of girls, each of whom found a $20 gold piece under a box of candy at her plate. There was not a girl there who did not know what delicate hint was hidden in that gold piece by which they were given to understand that things would become pretty lively before the night was over, and that anyone who did not care to contribute her share might leave her $20 gold piece and go. Those who stayed did so because they wanted to stay. This man, who clearly expected something in return for his generosity, was now interested in Evelyn. It was a potentially dangerous situation to be in. A friend took her to White's studio in August 1901. She would later describe the encounter in court testimony. 
The room was very gorgeous. It was all hung in velvet, and there were velvet divans and pillows everywhere, and this man was very big, and I thought very ugly. We went up two flights of stairs and got into another room, and in this room was a red velvet swing, and Mr. White would put us in the swing, and we would swing up to the ceiling. He would push us. There was a big Japanese umbrella on the ceiling, so when he would push us, he pushed us so our feet would crash through. The image of the grown, mature White pushing Evelyn, who was in her mid-teens, on a swing seems quaint and almost wholesome, but it did not last. In her court testimony, Evelyn described what happened on an occasion not long after, a time when she had dinner with White at his apartment. The meal was fine. The trouble started when they were finished eating. Mr. White asked me to come and see the back room, which was a bedroom, and I sat down at a table, a tiny little table. There was a bottle of champagne, a small bottle, and one glass. Mr. White picked up the bottle and out of the glass full of champagne. He came to me and told me to finish my champagne. I didn't care much for it. He insisted that I drink this glass of champagne, which I did. It was bitter and funny tasting, and I don't know whether it was a minute or two minutes after, but a pounding began in my ears, a pounding and pounding. Then the whole room seemed to go around, and everything got very black. When I woke up, all my clothes were pulled off me, and I was in bed. I sat up in bed and started to scream. Mr. White was there. He came over and asked me to please keep quiet. It's all over now. She had been raped. After this, she continued to see White and be friendly with him, although she never allowed herself to be put in that sort of helpless situation ever again. He told me that he wanted me. He told me over and over again. He always wanted me to come back to the bedroom. I said that I would never do so. Some would be skeptical of her story. They said if she was truly raped, she would not have continued to have such cordial relations with him. But then, as now, women who have been assaulted by powerful men sometimes face economic and other pressures to continue to maintain ties with their rapists. White showered Evelyn's mother with gifts and even sent her brother to school and paid the hospital expenses of one of Evelyn's friends. All of that would have gone away had she turned him in for what he did. So she stayed silent and kept him in her life, and the flow of gifts and security continued. Then she met the wealthy Henry Thaw, a man in his mid-thirties who looked much younger. Thaw had nothing like the accomplishments of a Stanford White. He had gotten his money via inheritance. But like White, Thaw had a reputation that went beyond merely having riches. He came from Pittsburgh, which, for some, was already a mark against him. The city suffered from a poor reputation in those days. One young Pittsburgh millionaire married his mother's French maid. Another divorced his wife after accusing her of having an affair with her coachman. And still another left his wife for a New York City actress. Thaw seemed very much cut from that same cloth. His nickname was Mad Harry. People whispered that when he was a student at Harvard, he was called before the university president on charges of moral turpitude and given just three hours to leave the university. In New York, he tried to ride a horse up the stairs of the Union Club and once drove a car through a display window. He was reckless with his money. On one occasion, he lost $40,000 in a poker game. That would be the equivalent of $1.3 million today. He threw lavish dinners. At one, the guests were a hundred ladies of the stage. And as part of the meal, each of them were given jewels valued at seven to $800. That is the equivalent of over $20,000 today. There was still a darker side to Thaw. He liked to whip girls and boys. Ethel Thomas filed suit against him for an incident that happened in 1902. She described to the court what happened. At first, he lavished much affection on me. One day, however, we were walking and he stopped at a store and bought a dog whip. 
I asked him what that was for, and he replied laughingly, That's for you, dear. I thought he was joking. But no sooner were we in the apartment than his entire demeanor changed. A wild expression came into his eyes, and he seized me, and with his whip beat me until my clothes hung in tatters. And that was just the tip of the iceberg. A madam named Susie Merrill testified that she maintained premises that Saul used to whip girls. According to Merrill, she helped facilitate the payment of $40,000 to 233 girls that Thaw had whipped. Thaw got interested in Evelyn after he saw her in a show. After some persuasion, he convinced her to go on some dinner dates with him. He reminisced about these early days in his memoir, The Traitor. I don't remember all. She liked my wrists and hands. I was wrong, for I said my wrists should be thicker and she said she was sorry as she liked mine, but she agreed with me. I did not know then that mine were strong, no matter if extremely muscular, and additional bones heavier than mine were useless. Thaw and Evelyn ended up taking a couple of rather eventful trips to Europe. When they were in Paris, Thaw proposed marriage to the young Evelyn. She refused, telling him that she couldn't marry him because of what Stanford White had done to her. But the trip continued. For a short time, the two were separated, Thaw going to London while Evelyn was occupied elsewhere. Thaw recalled, Evelyn wanted to write me twice each day, but in answering, I asked for six letters a day, which wasn't bad. I got the six. The couple reunited, and then something happened, which Evelyn later described in an affidavit. After breakfast, Thaw said he wished to tell me something and asked me to step into my bedroom. I entered the room when Thaw, without any provocation, grasped me by the throat and tore the bathrobe from my body. I saw by his face that Thaw was in a terrific, excited condition and was terrorized. His eyes were glaring and he had in his right hand a cowhide whip. He seized hold of me and threw me on the bed. I was powerless and attempted to scream, but Thaw placed his fingers in my mouth and tried to choke me. He then, without any provocation and without the slightest reason, began to inflict on me several severe and violent blows with the cowhide whip. So brutally did he assault me that my skin was cut and bruised. I besought him to desist, but he refused. I was so excited that I shouted and cried. He stopped every minute or so to rest and then renewed his attack upon me, which he continued for about seven minutes. He acted like a demented man. I was absolutely in fear for my life. When she returned to America, Evelyn told her friend Stanford White what had happened. It was White who advised her to describe the abuse in an affidavit. She did so and used that affidavit to obtain a generous financial settlement from Thaw. After this, Thaw was said to hate White for having interfered in his relationship with Evelyn. The young Evelyn, however, would later write even more details about what Thaw was like. Thaw was given to practices which were not pleasant to relate. On one occasion, as I was told he had amused himself by pouring boiling water over a girl in a bath, and on another, he had flogged a young girl who had been strapped to a bedpost. Thaw told her he would change. He promised to reform. And then he asked her to marry him. This time, she said yes. It is unclear why exactly she changed her mind. The two married in April 1905, a little more than a year before Thaw would murder White. The marriage does not seem to have been a happy one. Not long before the killing, Evelyn confided to a friend the thaw had become incredibly jealous and possessive. She could not answer, she said, for the life of any man he might see her with. Before the trial began, Thaw's mother hired a press agent to play up the idea of Thaw is a wronged moral avenger who killed White to protect womanhood. They tried to play down some of the more inconvenient facts, such as that Thaw himself was clearly guilty of doing acts that were just as bad, if not worse, than anything White did. They didn't mention that he complained in jail about not being able to drink champagne, 
and they instead focused on details about how he was visited every day by his devoted wife and widowed mother. It worked, at least to a certain extent. For example, Reverend Charles Eaton, who was the pastor of John D. Rockefeller, said, it would be a good thing if there was a little more shooting in cases like this. In his closing argument, Thaw's attorney, Delphin Delmas, laid it on thick while describing Thaw. He struck as a tigress strikes to protect her young. He struck for the purity of the American home. He struck for the purity of the American maiden. He struck, and who shall say that if he believed on that occasion that he was an instrument of God and an agent of providence, that he was an error? The jury in that case could not reach a verdict and was deadlocked. Thaw was tried again. This time, he was found not guilty by reason of temporary insanity and sent to an asylum, where he is said to have enjoyed far more privileges than the typical patient. It therefore was not too difficult for him to escape in 1913 and slip into Canada. He shortly thereafter returned to the United States and was declared in a new trial to no longer be insane. He was set free in 1915, but he was not out for long. In 1916, he lured a 19-year-old named Frederick Gump to a hotel room by offering to pay for the young man's education. But it was a lie. When Gump got to the hotel room, Thaw was waiting there with a whip. He assaulted the teen. Thaw was charged with kidnapping and beating Gump, and once again was sent to an asylum. He remained there until 1924. He ultimately died in 1947, leaving behind an estate that would be valued at over $12 million in 2021 dollars. Evelyn got some financial support from the Thaw family during the trials, but they cut her off afterwards. She and Thaw got divorced in 1915. To support herself, she married a vaudeville dancer named Jack Clifford, and they worked up a stage act. But it didn't work out. People say he didn't like being known as Mr. Evelyn Nesbitt. Clifford soon left her. Evelyn tried to support herself by operating a speakeasy. Those who knew her claimed she struggled with alcoholism and morphine addiction. Stanford White may have been the one who was shot and killed, but in many ways the real victim in this case was Evelyn Nesbitt. Her own mother seemed to think of her as little more than a beautiful device to beguile money and security out of rich men. Her husband, Harry Thaw, claimed to love her enough to kill for her. But that was a lie. If he loved her, he would have trusted her to decide for herself whether or not to pursue legal remedies against White. He would not have taken it upon himself to ensure that she would be obliged to share the worst moments of her life in court testimony that would be spread in newspapers all over the country. And he certainly would have provided her with enough funds so that she could have spent the rest of her life in comfort. To Thaw, Evelyn was just a pretty toy, and it annoyed him that another man got to play with it first. In researching this episode, we looked up old articles on newspapers.com, but the biggest help was three books. The first was Glamorous Sinners by Frederick Collins. This volume, published in the 1930s when memories were fresh, is full of color and memorable details and quotes from the press. It is a lot of fun. We also consulted The Murder of Stanford White by Gerald Langford. The title of the book, as you can tell, is a bit unimaginative, but it is descriptive and tells you exactly what you will get. The book is like that too. It is not as colorful or fun as Collins, but it provides a solid overview of the basic facts of the case. We also lightly dip into The Traitor by Henry Thaw, which is primarily useful for the glimpses it gives us into Thaw's mind. I collect books on true crime, and I fortunately happen to have each of these titles in my library when we decide to do an episode on this case. And remember, if you or someone you know is experiencing domestic abuse, please call the National Domestic Violence Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. Again, that's 1-800-799-7233.
Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenley, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet, and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.